My name is Ross Munley. I'm Director of Alumni Relations here at DCU, and I'm delighted to be your MC for the next hour or so. Throughout this week in Get Digital, we will be exploring a range of topics related to business, leadership, and entrepreneurship, with a particular focus on how businesses at all stages and of all sizes can harness transformational digital technologies to achieve their business goals. Turning to this session now, I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, himself a DCU graduate, Brian Clear, Marketing Director at Kerrygold USA, who will be talking about growing Kerrygold in America in a fragmented media landscape. To our audience, we would love to receive your questions, so please submit them during the session using the Q&A function, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Please be aware that the chat function is disabled, so please only use the Q&A option. Uh, we will then compile, compile the questions and I will ask Brian to address as many as he can in the time that we have available. This will take place after Brian's initial presentation. Uh, so looking forward to your questions, please remember use the Q&A function uh, as the chat is disabled. So without further delay, I'll hand you over to Brian. Thanks, Ross, um, and thanks for inviting me to have a chat this morning. So, um, yeah, my name is Brian Clear. Um, as Ross said, I'm a graduate of the Masters in E-Commerce 10 years ago, uh, which I didn't like to be reminded of. Um, but yeah, so today um, I'm dialing in from Chicago, which is where Kerrygold's North American business is based. Um, and I'm just going to go through some of the different things that we do here to um, reach our target consumer and uh, give a little bit of an overview of how um, how the brand has been grown or, or has how the brand has been growing and continues to grow. Um, so yeah, I'll just share my screen here. Ross, I know you're on mute there, so give me a thumbs up if you can see that. Yeah. We can see that now, Brian. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sweet. Okay, cool. Um, okay, firstly, so Kerrygold is, uh, I suppose, the brand, but it's owned by Ornua uh, Cooperative, which is Ireland's largest dairy exporter. Um, we export, or Ornua exports, to about 110 countries globally, uh, 2.3 billion annualized sales. Um, the company I suppose in terms of Ornua it's, it is a co-op it's a commercial co-op so ultimately owned by Irish dairy farmers and generally the business is sort of split into two so there's ingredients and there's consumer foods and the ingredients is generally sort of b2b sales of ingredients that um, will end up in a I suppose an end consumer product uh, but then the consumer food side um, is packaged goods that someone will purchase at shelf and uh, I suppose the jewel in the crown is Kerrygold. Um, for those who don't know Kerrygold or know the background to Kerrygold, so it was originally, um, or knew it was originally called On Board Banya, which is the milk board, which evolved into um, the Irish Dairy Board, which was rebranded to Ornua. Um, but originally a government sponsored entity became semi-state and now it's kind of independent commercial cooperative. But essentially the genesis of Ornua and the genesis of Kerrygold was to consolidate and coordinate the exportation of Irish dairy products off the island. Off, off the island. So we only consume, Ireland is, when I say we, I mean Ireland, um, Ireland consumes about 15% of the dairy that it produces. So it has to or knew his job is basically to find homes for that other 85%. Um, but yeah, so all of that was sort of originally started by the government and um, they wanted to put, I suppose, all of it under one umbrella. And the first task was to generate a brand for Irish butter. And so Sir Tony O'Reilly was uh, in charge at the time and, and he's often... Um, I suppose, uh, given the title of creating Kerry Gold or whatever. So, um, yeah, 1962 launched in the UK, our near to, nearest trading partner at the time. And that image at the top left of um, um, people holding up Kerry Gold butter or whatever, that's from the original uh, launch back in 62. 
Um, 10 years, it wasn't actually for another 10 years before the brand was actually launched on the local market in Ireland, so in 72. Um, and that same year we launched in Germany. In Germany now, um, the brand turned quicker than a Coca-Cola product in, in the grocery stores there. So um, it is very much a household name in Germany. Um, there's even a street, Kerrygoldstrasse, which is where the office is, is uh, just outside of Frankfurt. Um, so yeah, so while Sornua exports to about 110 markets, the Kerrygold brand and or branded items is exported to maybe about 80. So um, Germany being probably the biggest market followed by the US. Um, and, uh, you know, whilst the local market in Ireland would understand it as a butter brand in Germany, it would very much be a, a dairy brand. So it's in multiple categories. So that's cheese. Um, we were in yogurt. Um, we've done different adjacent dairy categories as well. Um, and uh, yeah, also side of Kerrygold brand is, does in regions that consume their milk in a powdered format. So they milk powder that's reconstituted into liquid milk. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, uh, Kerrygold branded milk, pro uh, milk powder is, is also uh, um, a product skew. So in, in terms of the US, um, uh, I'll just maybe give a little bit of a background to how the brand came to be in the US. So we, we first launched with cheese. Uh, so it was Kerrygold cheeses uh, back in 1991. Um, in 1998, we added Kerrygold Dubliner to the portfolio. Most people in Ireland would know Dubliner as a brand unto itself, but it's it's actually owned by Ornua um, and uh, we license it locally. But um with one of our co-op members but um but yeah it was it was launched in the u.s market in 98 uh, and then in the back end of 98 into 99 we were the strategy for the brand started to evolve a little bit um and moving away from heavy you know um tapping into irish american strongholds new england area and then also tapping into the occasion of you know St. Patrick's Day and, and all around that and a lot of volume, a lot of effort was kind of isolated those regions. But um I suppose the where the strategy started to evolve was like that was telling the story of the brand and Irish products and Irish produce and how our system in Ireland was a little bit different to what's you know the norm here in the, in the US. Um, but we ended up getting a trial with a retailer called Trader Joe's um, in 1999. And then that, I suppose, started to build momentum. And from there, you know, you get more listings, more listings and, and, and so on and so on. So um, the categories that we operate at the moment in the US uh, is butter. So we have our foil items, and then we have sticks, which is the most consumed uh, unit of butter, let's say, versus a uh, foil. Foil is kind of, um, maybe a little bit more alien, I suppose, to uh, the US, US consumer compared to sticks. Um, and then we've tubs and flavored butters as well. We also operate in specialty cheese and dairy oil. So this would probably be more um, uh, an industry vernacular rather than a consumer facing vernacular, vernacular. But again, an Irish context would be if you go to a super value and where you go to buy your camembert and your brie and your fancy cheeses, that's called a specialty oil here in the US, lower footfall, different usage occasion. Um, and then the dairy oil is where you go to get your easy cheese singles or, or whatever your everyday cheeses and stuff. So higher footfall, different price point, different usage occasion. So yeah, so we have, um, yeah, we're in those three sort of subcategories within dairy. And we, uh, a couple of years ago, I mean, when I first joined the business, whatever, four and a half years ago, we used to talk about ourselves in the, um, you know, the number one imported butter or whatever. But now we've evolved that uh, just due to due to double digit growth over the last 10 or so years. But we're now the number two butter brand in the US. Um, number one, specialty cheddar. Uh, we categorize Dubliner as a cheddar, but technically Dubliner isn't a cheddar but we won't go into that now but it's a cheddar like anyway and then we've three of the top six uh, specialty cheddar positions um, in the US so that's our reserve and our aged so they're a little bit more mature and they are cheddars 
Cool. So that's sort of where we are level setting in the US. From a marketing perspective, um, I suppose our department, these are generally broad strokes, the, the areas that we, we look after. Um, from social and content and digital and print and TV, I'll, I'll probably talk about that in a touch more detail. Um, so I won't dwell too much on them just now. Um, the other facets, just again, broad strokes, PR and sponsorship. So we would do, a, and, and, and that's been a foundation of our growth in the brand is, is finding out and telling an authentic story amongst people who inform consumers about what to eat and what's on trend and what's good and what's um, great. Um, so PR has been a really important uh, pillar in, in our marketing mix in, in, in terms of getting to the right people who then, you know, inform another audience. Um, sponsorships kind of linked into that as well, because we, we've done a lot of sponsorships around um, food adjacent, um, you know, events and activities. Um, events and sampling, again, that this has been another one that's evolved in the last year. Um, well, been pretty much on pause for last year, but um, another foundational kind of pillar of the marketing mix um, for the US because, you know, simplifying it once people have tried Kerrygold butter or they've tried the cheese, they generally know that there's something different about it. Um, you know, it's not discernible between what they're accustomed to. So, you know, we'll have done over the years, over the years, millions, but over the, in a given year, you know, hundreds and thousands of tastings and meeting someone either at the point of purchase in store or attendance at like food and wine events that would have fairly high footfall across the country. And it's also a way to get into the nooks and cranny of the country outside of the big metropolitan uh, centers. Um, insights and data. So yes, we handle that on our team. Won't go into too much, but you know, we do need to understand a lot about this consuming in the US. We do need to figure out things that require research and, and data um, that your own intuition can't, um, uh, can't deduce. And then, you know, just in terms of testing things, make sure that things are right before we, we go to market. Innovation is part of the uh, pipeline here for the US, but we still have a lot of runway um, with where we're at. Um, whilst we're the number two brand, butter brand, we still have a good bit to go well that we feel a good good bit to go and then category management is just um a subset of, of marketing that kind of uh, leaks into sales or that does leak into sales that's generally about um you know informing the retailer on what's the best way to merchandise and you know what's the best item for their consumer and you know it's it's a uh, it's, it's generally data driven kind of uh, meant to be completely objective um but anyway um, so today I'm going to talk about social, digital, print, and TV. Um, just before that, again, I'll, I'll keep it kind of broad strokes. Um, in terms of the core communication pillars for the brand here, and there's a lot more nuance beyond this, but generally we, we, we talk about, I suppose, the functional reason to be believe in, in the product and brand and, and the first pillar being you know, milk from grass-fed cows on low intensive farms, family owned, you know, you know, very, very um, um, idyllic in one, but in, in one sense, but, but just our whole dairy environment lends itself to, um, you know, a very natural product. Superior taste. Um, and, you know, I spoke about that, you know, in terms of how we, um, you know, how we meet consumers and we give them product and taste and, and all of that but then also layered into our communication is is ensuring that we are driving home you know that uh that message as well and then ireland um as a third pillar you know is very important because it provides us a bit of differentiation um compared to the um you know competitive set provides a standout on shelf um and i suppose you know you know if you think about what reaching a consumer generally you want to anchor in or hook one or two or three different things in their mind that you know makes them remember you um you know milk from grass-fed cows does that irishness does that 
taste does that. Um, and, you know, if you're to ask someone on the street, you know, Kerrygold, you know, they might say, oh, that's that grass fed product or that butter brand or cheese brand. Or that's that brand from Ireland. Um, so, yeah, uh, the other thing that these do for us that um, kind of sets us apart is, you know, milk from grass fed cows is puts us in the same realm as a kind of natural product and, and brand. Um, but we, you know, organic brands here, if I'm to really kind of simplify it and, and um, you know, people don't necessarily always buy organic brands because they taste good. They buy them because they're either feeding someone that they love or they, you know, their kids or, or whatever, and they want something that's clean going into them, but they don't necessarily want um do not really drive in it as buying it because of, of taste so yeah so we're in that sort of unique position where we deliver on taste but then we also have the nat nat natural grass-fed credentials and then we also have a differentiator in that we're irish and imported and um different to domestic um cool so i think one thing to uh, remember with this market is it is massive you know you have 330 million consumers 128 million households and you have a very very fragmented um because of that volume of people there's the opportunity for all of these networks to carve out a little niche and um so it's it's very very dispersed very very frag fragmented but um i suppose the point or the message here is that you know you could get very carried away with um reach and reaching consumers but if you don't have your consumer target down of who actually is mentally available to purchase your product um you know you could just be wasting i suppose investment uh, in media channels that aren't really gonna meet the right consumer that you want to actually be reaching um and then also what i mean by I suppose staying true to your brand is you know the carry gold it doesn't make sense for Kerrygold to be advertising, you know, during college football, you know, um, or, you know, a golf tournament or, or well, maybe that's not the best example, but, you know, we do need to be um, cognizant of what content we're aligning ourselves to. So generally, you know, popular food shows, you know, that's a right fit. Um, but, you know, stuff that maybe might have, you know, could be a drama or violence or, you know, CSI or whatever, that's probably not the right fit as well. So you got to stay true to who your target is and, and ensuring that you're picking channels and uh, uh, that that are right for your target, but then also that there's an adjacency there that's right for your brand. Um, the last year, I suppose, has altered the landscape and I'll, I'll just touch on, on some of this change in revenue. Now, so I suppose this is a change in revenue um rather than change in consumption so uh, but generally the two of them sort of follow a, a similar path but um in general all media has been down uh, you know versus a year ago in uh, looking at well this is september 2020 2019 so looking at that point in time versus uh, previous but um yeah tv down um, and, you know, you could attribute that to a lot of live sport events um, that, you know, would demand a, um, a premium for advertisers here in the US. Some of that cancelled, postponed, not was it not exactly what it was. Um, print in terms of newspapers and magazines, you know, declining subset, but um, probably even more pronounced because, you know, you're not getting newsstand sales, um, et cetera. Radio also down because um, generally people weren't traveling in their cars as, as much as they were. There wasn't a commute. Um, and I suppose, you know, with that also comes a decline in revenue and out of home, you know, people not, I suppose, people not going out as much. And if they're not on the road, you know, they're not seeing, you know, billboard advertising, they're not in cinemas as well because of, of lockdown and that. So yeah, softening in digital as well. Um, but I suppose over the top, is where you see, you know, that swing and, and, you know, that can absolutely be mapped to everybody's own personal lives of, of how they've consumed media and, you know, um, you know, where revenue has actually, sorry, ad revenue has kind of shifted towards that space. Um, so just going into talk a little bit about what 
we do here and different ways that we try to engage um, consumers. Um, so in terms of social and content, I think generally, you know, I think of it as um, your shop front and where prospective buyer can come and, and you know, do some tire kicking, but, you know, learn a little bit more about, uh, about your brand. Um, and I think, you know, if we could, we would love to bring everybody to Ireland to see how what is normal to an Irish person is not necessarily the same here. Um, but yeah, so we do look for different ways to kind of, um, you know, showcase the nuances of Ireland's dairy system. And, um, you know, on the shown on screen here is from our website where we, you know, we'll have 360 videos of, you know, showing they can go, a consumer can go and, you know, figure out and wander around a farm, learn a little bit more about, um, you know, the specific nuances of our dairy system. So grass fed, um, and they can dig as deep as they want or stay as uh, a little bit more bird's eye if they want to as well. Um, but generally, you know, social content is our opportunity to go deeper on our, our messaging. Um, similarly with food, you know, it's also a way that we can, um, you know, bring chefs to the fore and, you know, get them to talk about our products, you know, organically. Um, you know, Irish chefs, local chefs, uh, it doesn't, uh, you know, we'll, we'll mix it up a little bit, but, but generally our approach to social and content is to tell a more nuanced story. Um, from a digital standpoint, um, you know, so just to clarify when we say social content and digital in, in our vernacular, generally digital, we're talking about paid digital. Um, so that will be whilst that will be paid social but it's also other channels as well so we'll do different partnerships we'll do programmatic um, um media buying we'll do um you know could be audio ads on pandora or spotify or or pre-roll and, and, and all of that so um this is just an example of when we're in a campaign mode in digital um this is one uh campaign that we did a year or two back um called music behind the recipes and, and generally the genesis of this idea was um, you know, that someone, when they're in the kitchen and when they're enjoying food, whether that's out at a restaurant or whatever, music is actually a, a, a layer on, on that augments that. So we sort of felt that, you know, that was an area that the brand could actually play in and that would, would, would make sense. So we had a series of chefs, um, you know, former top chefs, winner, a couple of Irish chefs or whatever, who generated recipes and then also generated playlists that they listen to when they're in the kitchen um, whether it's you know cooking baking eating dining or whatever um, and uh, yeah so we married the two so they developed in this custom content um, and then you know also with this sort of added benefit of like you know what they listen to and, and give a little bit more uh, insight to behind the chef then in terms of like a uh, hook as well, we also shot this little launch video that um, I'll play now in a second, but essentially we put on a, a, a cow concert is the informal name for what we did, but we, we had an Irish band who sat out in the field and I don't know if people know that, but dairy cows are, or Irish cows are generally quite curious animals. Um, so we sort of orchestrated them in one field and the curiosity, I suppose, gets better than so uh, I'll just play that now. Um, Ross, you might interrupt me if the sound for some reason doesn't work, but. The opening wings are stars in the night, they don't know what is new, what is old. All the evergreen hill is home to them still, they don't live to be young, to be old, to be old. is home to them still they don't live to be red to be born to be
Yeah, so this was a finalist in an FE as well, um, uh, I think last year as well. So um, yeah, and look, point is cut through, we can just continue to show cows grazing nice images or whatever, but we need to, if we're to reach our target consumer, break through the noise of, of um, you know, doom scrolling or whatever, we need to do these sort of things that sort of um, differentiate ourselves, you know, that the brand has licensed to do. Um, yeah, I mean, just touching on print, uh, it's another foundational, um, I suppose, media channel for the brand. Um, you know, there's been declines in different publications here or there, but independent of that, you know, with 320 million people, um, consumers, you know, it does provide an outlet for us to, to generate um, reach and reach a fairly highly uh, targeted consumer in the sense that people who um, consume Epicurean publications, food publications, are know their know their onions in terms of food, you know. So, um, so yeah. So this is continues to be a channel in terms of the context. You know, the context is someone is consuming a food magazine. The advertising should lean forward into um, taste and uh, and evoke a moment as well, so that it's it's you know. I don't want to say organic in 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 the consume consumption process of a magazine, but you know that it's well branded, but that it also sits well in in where we're um, placing it. And uh, yes, yeah, so then maybe I'll just before I finish up and we do Q and A's, maybe just talk a little bit about TV. I mean, generally, uh, in simplifying it, you know, you I suppose globally and in, in more pronounced in different markets than others, but certainly in, it's very pronounced in this market is, you know, the movement from, you know, a straightforward TV landscape where, you know, everybody was wired into, um, you know, a cable subscription or whatever. And, and now you have this sort of fragmentation and then a little bit of blurring as well. Um, so, you know, device wise, they're using different devices to consume, uh, consume, I suppose, in a TV environment. And then they're watching through different um, mediums as well, some of which, you know, you can't advertise on um, and uh, some of which, you know, you've maybe limited targeting. But generally, I suppose it, it's 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 for the better um, for brands and, and for ourselves. Um, you know, if you think about it, you're the, the traditional sort of TV media planning is, you know, you're you're generating indices of your target against different content. I suppose where we've sort of moved to now with, you know, cord, cord cutting and, and more hyper targeting is that we can layer on shopper data. So we do have the ability and we have done that is, is you know, we can pull from, um, you know, what someone is purchasing at store and that could be competitive products. It could be, you know, capacity or mental availability for you know natural um grass-fed sort of product uh dairy we can avoid certain you know consumers who, who, who wouldn't purchase our product as well um so we can layer that into our targeting we can go very specific on age um and life stage you know do they have a family you know um etc etc um, household income as well is, is an important one because, you know, we need to determine, you know, a, a threshold for when someone is, again, mentally available to purchase our product versus they're not. And, and, you know, household income comes into that as well. And then behavioral, you know, in terms of what are their interests, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, that that's all sort of for the better, I suppose, um, you know, helped us in, in kind of reaching our, our target consumer. Um, but I suppose cord cutting sort of continues and, and then we do have the, you know, it's probably even more accelerated by, by COVID um, and, and you're seeing it across, across generations as well. So this is going to even probably benefit our reach or our ability to reach consumers even, even more so the more cord cutting that, that happens. Um, I suppose the one point I would get across is that maybe some people talk about um you know the lump some of these channels that are you know did you could call them digital but they're essentially the behavior of tv you know and that's you're either at home and you've got a tv and while you might have an amazon fire stick or a prime video subscription you're consuming media 
in a very similar fashion to how you would consume the old traditional TV. And so in that respect, you know, how you advertise kind of follows that similar path as well in, in that channel. So, you know, we wouldn't air, you know, a, a one minute, 20 second, you know, cow concert video to like uh, someone who's, you know, in the middle of a series binge on, on Prime Video, you know, that's not the right content for to be advertising to someone in that space. Um, we do follow that more traditional TV format. And so that's, you know, 60 second ads, 30 second ad, 15 seconds ad. Um, the other thing about TV creative versus, you know, um, other pieces of creative is, is I kind of think of it as like your elevator pitch. And if we go back to those three pillars that we talked about, you know, um, you know, you need to get those across, but then you also need to advertise the essence of your brand. Um, and certainly for Kerrygold, you know, it's, it's very much, um, it is those communication pillars, but it's also a little bit, um, it's, it's more than that. There's an emotional connection that people have to the brand. In Ireland, you know, it's, it's fairly pronounced that emotional connection. In the US, it is here as well. So it's not necessarily just something that's unique to, to Ireland. People do seem to love the brand and they have an emotional tie to it and, and, and all of that stuff. So I'll air you just before I wrap up and we do Q&A if there are any. Um, I'll just play our latest six. It's the 60 second version of a TV ad that we aired um, just uh, Q4 in 2020. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll go from there. Is anywhere you are me tonight? The streets are cold. Guys, you gotta get ready. And a small, soft, the girl I left. Oh, yeah. You, you waited for me. Happy first day. Did you guys help with this? Nothing tastes like together. Kerry Gold, crafted with milk from Irish grass fed cows. All right, and um, me, Brian, thank you very much for that uh, fantastic uh, presentation uh, and insights into uh, Kerry Gold. Um, just a reminder to our audience of attendees, if you would like to ask a question, uh, please just add that to the Q&A section, uh, the little icon there at the bottom of your screen, and I'll pick them up as we're, we're chatting for the next couple of minutes. Uh, so, Brian, a very, very interesting um, insight. Uh, I suppose with uh, 2.3 billion sales uh, and so on, uh, the marketing department can claim a lot of the credit for that. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um, when, yeah when things are going well for sure yeah for sure yeah yeah um a, a lot of pressure brian to, to meet those kind of sales and, and that kind of revenue every year um yeah for sure i mean like the i suppose the 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 general mission of ornua and you know by connection, I suppose, Kerrygold is to, you know, add value to Irish milk so it's not commoditized and and um, and ultimately it's to preserve a way of life that's indigenous to Ireland and that is Ireland's dairy farming system and family farming model, you know. So yeah, the pressure comes with that is that like yeah, you know, you, we we need to be showing that we're adding value to, um, you know, what to produce that farm gate you know and um and you know when you think about Kerrygold here you know the product is nearly you know twice the price of um domestic competitors um, 
and that is you know a testament to like having a strong brand and, and you know investing in the brand as well um but you know people are paying it's the number two brand, butter brand and people are pay, willing to pay you know twice the price for for that you know so yeah um pressure comes with other i suppose but um but yeah i mean like we have we have something that we need to kind of safeguard um, both at a farm level and then i suppose our job of, of that process is 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 um uh, being brand guardians let's say yeah and fantastic to to see some of the videos throughout the presentation and uh really powerful you, you at times i almost felt like i was in the field there um watching everything happen and so on and i noticed that throughout the presentation that um you referred to a kind of the organic based brands and how people really tune in to that when it's feeding someone they love yeah uh, and yeah. It, amazing that, that that that's an approach that obviously really works yeah i mean um it's funny i don't have children myself but i can um you know maybe there's different components of the food system that have been in the us or or in globally that have been you know broken in parts um but i can imagine being in a scenario that one when they're you know feeding you know who they've their own you know that they really want to make sure that whatever is is going in that their their kids bodies or, or whatever is like as pure as pure can be and organic is a uh, is a i suppose a consumer filter for that when they're at shelf um but grass-fed also has that sort of um that same sort of equity let's say um that's akin to that but yeah it's 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 certainly something that um you know people are more and more aware of that you know they're not willing to just take what's cheapest on the shelf they're they're yeah. they, there's another couple of filters in their cons consumption, um, you know, at shelf decision making, you know. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And, and just one of the questions that we've received was just in relation to the, uh, the, the beautiful countryside and so on. Do you align any of your campaigns with Fulcha Ireland? Um, we have in the past done shared, um, let's say, initiatives not in the US, but in Germany um, at, a, at scale, I mean, but yeah, there have been economies of scale of, you know, doing stuff um, with, with Fulcher or with Tourism Ireland as, uh, as I think they might be known internationally. But um, yeah, locally, I actually did just get an email yesterday and you mentioned it from someone who at Tourism Ireland who were running an event and they want to, they're doing a virtual event and you know, they want to talk about Irish food and that and stuff. So, you know, we'll we'll link in at different tactical things, you know, um, but yeah, so we do we do in in, in different different capacities, but um, yeah, yeah. Well, some of that uh, some of your videos there really sold the the countryside and and some of the unique selling points of Ireland. That's for sure. Uh, yeah. There's another question in just uh, could you ask Brian to share some insights into how Kerrygold conducts research on the cultural differences between uh, US American and the Irish consumers to help steer your marketing efforts? Yeah. Um, so we'll do, um, it depends on what it is, right? So, um, but generally, you know, we can do qualitative or quantitative um, studies. Um, we'll do, you know, let's say on, on one instance, it could be anything from you know, a survey where there's a question that we really want to understand something very nuanced um, at, it could be just to do with, you know, a pack and how someone is interpreting, you know, how we've branded a, a cheese or a butter item or, you know, or so, something like that. Um, but then there could be also a little bit more, you know, where we need to really, okay, someone's made that decision, but we want to understand what's going on in their brain so why they're making that decision or what's the uh, objective and so stuff like that relates to you know um we could do focus groups um and then we could segment them we'll often segment them maybe by different age groups life stages where they bought where they shop so you know costco would be our our biggest customer here in the us but that costco as a retailer if people are not familiar is unlike any other store here it's like a 
I'd nearly equate it to like a cash and carry. You buy things in bulk, always very high quality. Um, they take a lower margin um, and, you know, but you get this economy to scale, but you have to be a member of it as well. So you have to pay hundred dollars a year to, or whatever, to be a member of it. So that buyer is very different to someone who goes to a Walmart or someone who goes to a Trader Joe's. Um, so when we do research, you know, we will do, we could do a focus group and we could start to segment things because those buyers think very differently, you know? Um, so yeah, focus groups, we'll do surveys, we'll do brand trackers where we get a general sample of, of the populace of the US and we'll start to understand, you know, how aware are they of our brand versus other brands? What does our brand stand for versus theirs? Um, so a myriad of things. And then we will also uh, do, if we're going to launch a new product, we'll do consumer testing where, you know, we'll, we'll recruit, we'll send out, um, we'll recruit the right type of buyer, let's say, or prospective buyer, and they wouldn't be rejectors, let's say, of Kerrygold. Um, and, you know, we'll send them out samples, we'll get feedback and all that stuff. So, yeah, that can be complicated because we have to do short runs in Ireland, export them over here, uh, then ship them out <laughs> on, if you want to consumer. So a bit of a manual process to do that. Um, but uh, yeah, so we do we do lots of lots of research focus, like qualitative and quant. It just depends on what the ask is and, and what's the kind of strategic initiative. Yeah, very good. Uh, thanks for that. It's very detailed insight. Much appreciated, Brian. Uh, another question in in relation to brand positioning and how hard is it to keep Kerrygold's brand's position in the US? Um, is it at a stage where it will almost take care of itself or is it is, is it a difficult battle to retain a share of the market? Um, so we're, you know, we're probably, uh, I wouldn't say it's at a, I don't think any brand is at a stage that can should should think that you know this will does this will sell sell itself. Um, this I'm trying to think about a couple of ways to answer this or or give um give a bit of insight. I suppose one is look you know we're probably at about ten percent household penetration for butter. So you know we've ninety percent of households in the U.S. that aren't. Um, consuming our butter or having to consume our butter in the last 10 months, but we're the number two brand. So, you know, we have to continue to advertise if we want to continue to uh, grow um, and, you know, take more share from, from the, the um, I suppose, the market leader. And part of that is a evolution, evolving our media strategy that you don't want to be continually reaching the same consumers who you've converted. You need to figure out, you know, well, who's the next you know, um, consumer of Kerrygold, you know. Um, generally, our target, consumer target, is, is is probably a little bit older. So we are doing some work internally to start to figure out, right, what's the next gen that has, or subset that has, like, the mental availability to, to purchase Kerrygold. Um, I think the other thing is, is one has to be conscious of... Uh, people responding to your brand as well and so if you're not continuing to invest and continue to say all the good things about your brand and and, and be front of mind when someone is at that point of purchase um you can have other people you know come in and and take some of share i think uh you know thinking about um other brands here or other categories you know kind is a brand uh, you know, they do snack bars. I'm pretty sure they're available in, in, in Ireland. You know, that's a brand that maybe five years ago was probably maybe a little bit a la mode. But I don't think they invested as well as possibly other competitors here, like an RX bar um, or Cliff. Um, well, maybe Cliff, yeah. The other brands. So, you know, the, people it can be a crowded space, you know, and if, uh, if someone starts, starts to come in and you've taken the foot off and, or if, you know, the incumbent market leader, you know, starts to, you know, um, invest. And we have seen that and we, we do see that. And that's why we are confident that we need to continue to invest in, in the brand because we, we do see, you know, 
different movements in, in, in competitive activity, you know, um, different, you know, evolving of claims and stuff like that. So, yeah, so, so those are important things is, is just like, you know, growing and reaching new consumers, protecting the brand as well as share. And, you know, generally, you know, um, I say this again, broad strokes that US consumers like to be advertised to, I would say. We want to know what to buy and why to buy it. Um, I mean, someone was talking internally, like, you know, what other, what other sporting event do people tune in to watch advertising, you know, other than the Super Bowl? And I think that says a lot about how the US landscape is maybe different to other places, you know? Um, and, uh, and so to that end, it's another reason why you still need to continually invest in the brand and, um, and, and maintain a, a basic level of awareness and then also grow share. Yeah, yeah, um, brilliant. Thank you, you, Brian. We've got a question here in relation, in relation to advertising agencies and some, one of our uh, audience members just wondering, what is the pr proportion of participation in the creation of the ideas for campaigns in really uh, between Kerry Gold and advertising agencies hired, and yeah. if there is a main agency, um, yeah. if, if you're allowed or permitted to say who it, who that is, um, yeah. So the work that you would have that I would have shown there that was produced by a Chicago-based agency called Energy BBDO. So BBDO is a global, um, let's say, advertising network. I think their Dublin arm was called Irish International, it might be rebranded to just BBDO Dublin, um, but Energy BBDO is the Chicago um, entity of that. So in what term, how involved is, um, yeah, I mean, we would be good partners with um, our agency here. Um, it's difficult to, like I've, I've worked at different stages of my career, I've worked on the agency side and also, um, um, on the client side um yeah and then i've also seen different walks of life you know where you know bad not a bad agency relationship but you know a, a challenging agency relationship where you know either party aren't listening or one is too headstrong and the other one isn't you know uh or the other one is so i think it's very much a collaborative process because if you were to give anyone you know, we know a lot about the brand, let's say. We know a lot about the consum consumer. If someone asks about research and insights, we know a lot about the consumer. If you're giving someone a task to develop, you know, a 30 second TV ad, they have to translate a lot of ideas about your brand that you know, they're very distilled, point, um, you know, perspective. And sometimes, you know, I've seen different ideas where, you know, the brand has been proposed, you know, to be, you know, we need a spokesperson for the brand. Liam Neeson or, you know, someone like that is like, you know, an embodiment of who the brand is. They'd be great. And we're like, that's, you know, our, our point of view would not be aligned to that, you know, that the brand speaks for itself. And, you know, when you do a spokesperson led activity, it really anchors you in a point of time and, and all of that type of stuff. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's very much, I know we're bumping up at time here, it's very much a collaborative thing where you're, as a brand guardian, you need to ensure that all of the ideals and all the ideas and all of the things that you believe or that you know to be true about the brand are translated in to a piece of creative. It was the TV ad that I just showed there, you know, um, that fielded in a period of time where you know it was during thanksgiving christmas period so there's a little bit of that um it's not overt but there's a little bit of a, a wintry sort of holiday sort of vibe to it um you know it's also a deal in a period of time where people were just about the family you know and it was just about you know doing something for everyone. everyone's going through a tough time within the family unit you know and it's going that little extra mile that translate to you know, Kerry Gold is, is sort of essence of Kerry Gold, what Kerry Gold is, and this, you know, it's about coming together and breaking bread and, and bonding through food. And then obviously there's there's functional components in there that with an, an advertising agency, so I've seen some ad agencies, if they had it their way, the brand wouldn't be mentioned, you know, 
there would be no pack shots, there'd be no locals, you know, there might be a voiceover at the end, you know. Um, so those are all things where you're the collaborator, but then you're also the police person or police man or woman as well to ensure that those things don't get lost because ultimately you're selling the product, you know. I will say just to add on that, the ad I would have made coming over here five years ago or whenever, four and a half years ago, is very different to the ad that I'd make that like that ad that we would make today because not knowing how much that this like i've heard in focus groups as well when we've tested ads and someone else, i know someone else about research is we will test ads before we go to market and and you know and we measure lots of different things but you know so i have heard sometimes when we've maybe done a b tested one less branded version one more branded version where people are like will you tell me what the hell you're selling i want to buy it but i don't know what <laughs> brand this is for you know so all of those things that's a very long-winded response but all of those things are sort of layered into that agency client sort of partnership yeah. part. you're part of the creative process you, you shepherd you get to say you know that's a good concept that concept's so wrong for us you know channel things down but then you also really have to you know um yeah so there it's it's a good collaboration it can it's yeah. challenging you know uh, and by the sounds of things, uh, you make sure that, you know, despite what the ideas are and um, those those concepts that are developed, that before you go to market, you'd always test them with the customers as well. So um, mm -hmm. always being in touch with the customer is obviously a, a huge yep. priority. And, and great to hear you speaking about the importance of staying loyal to the values of your brand and how, mm -hmm. how they'll never get lost. And I think in the examples that you showed uh, throughout the presentation today, that is without doubt uh, absolutely true. Um, a question here in terms of trends, have uh, you know dietary trends such as veganism, uh, high protein, et cetera, impacted the brand strategy? Uh, and how do you remain relevant with constant new food and diet trends? Yeah, it's a good question. Um... I mean, look, I'm sure it's the same in Ireland, but you know, we walk into the store, there is there is shelf space carved out for people who are um, following a vegan diet or want to dabble in that, both in meat and also in, in dairy. Um, so, you know, generally I think we we try to talk about, you know, the Okay, we're not a functional brand in the sense of that we're not overtly functional going out and saying, you know, our day, our cows are out this amount of days, they're this, the scientific side of things go into what, you know, what makes this product great. Um, we do, people who are in the know kind of know that. We have that sort of available on our website to explain, you know, our dairy system and, you know, you know, animal welfare is one that is, you know, is, is, is a hot topic and we try to translate or show that as much as possible on our, on our website and in our social and, and all of that. Um, I think, um, you know, we, we probably wouldn't be putting on our cheese packaging, you know, contains X grams of protein or whatever, because, um, you know, there's a, we're more about, I think we're more focused on a taste forward message rather than like a functional sort of uh, message. Um, but that's not to say that those are things that we're not considering, like that do come into conversation internally, you know, you know, should we actually just, you know, for example, something very simple, you know, and this, you know, putting on our cheese back is like on the on the backpack just saying suitable for vegetarians because the rennet we use is is vegetarian friendly you know or whatever those are tiny little things that you know do have an impact because if i'm following a vegetarian diet you know i'll want to just get that assurance and not have to think about it beyond that so so they do dietary trends do influence things i probably i don't think it will change our overt messaging um you know we try to keep it simple imported from ireland milk from grass-fed cows you know, superior taste, um, if, if that's our, our, our elevator pitch. Um, and then for, I suppose I spoke about it on, on social, you know, people want to dig a little bit deeper, understand animal welfare, creds, you know, our sustainability creds, all of that is sort of there for the, for the more um, curious consumer. 
Yeah, brilliant. And um, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, another question here, and, and we'll be we'll wrap up in the next five minutes, but uh, some brilliant questions continuing to flow in here. So Brian, you're a real hit with our, with our uh, attendees. Uh, could you share some insights about relative spend across media types? Yeah, okay. I probably can't give you exact dollar amounts, but um, I'd say TV and what I would classify as TV based on the sort of the, the back half of my presentation there is, is, you know, that covers connected TV and over the top as well. Um, but, you know, that would probably command, you know, two thirds of, of our media budget, you know, there or thereabouts. Um, and then digital would follow after that and, and then print would follow after that. So, um, and I suppose, you know, t TV is, 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 gets a lot of reach here. You know, it's where you can, you know, it's penetration for TV is, is very, very high. And, um, you know, when we're, when we've got our razor, when we've got our laser target, you know, consumer target sort of down, what we're looking to is to really maximize the reach of that consumer target that exists in the US. And TV is an avenue to do that, but it's expensive. Um, and uh, so digital then can also help bridge that, that gap and then in print as well. But yeah, generally, you know, you're talking maybe for ourselves, you know, about two thirds is going on in TV, you know. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, appreciate it. Difficult question when, when uh, uh, to, to answer and so on. But um, another question, how hard is it to market a single brand to such a large market? Are there any areas in the US targeted with specific campaigns? Uh, yes, yeah, so we, we have done, um, so we can do geo-targeting for sure. So if we have a new product, let's say, and it's only in a couple of retailers or whatever, we have done that before where we're literally only advertising to people that are in an area where the product is available. Um, but I think it's, it's still back to that same thing as like defining that target and staying true to that, that this is who can and would buy our product and not getting like, you know, like, so many cold call emails from, I don't know, um, the people about, you know, last minute deals, you know, get a billboard in Times Square or, you know, we've got a fire sale on, you know, United Airlines kind of in flight view. Like you could just get Pied Pipered into so many stuff, but you just really got to come back to that target and like not get, don't try to be everything to everyone. You need to really say like, this is who is going to buy our product this is who we need to stay now if that's not converting or if that's not doing we know it's working because we see bumps in our awareness we see that at shelf um so yeah if that doesn't happen then you obviously need to rethink that brilliant uh brian thank you thank you so much it has been an absolute pleasure to to have you with us and for sharing all of those insights um with us uh, you have been fantastic to listen to really inspiring and um, uh, from my own perspective as director of alumni relations just uh, very proud to see a dcu graduate uh, uh, making such a, a massive massive impact on an irish company abroad so keep up the great work we, we really right. appreciate it and be sure to drop into us the next time you do visit uh, visit home and you fly and fly by we'll have the kettle yeah. on and we'll be sure to wine you and dine you in the business school <laughs> <laughs> yeah look listen thanks again uh ross really appreciate uh the invite and um yeah look it's great to talk about um a brand that one is proud of as well as gets to work on you know um and uh yeah i'll take you up on that whenever i can get home <laughs> brilliant Hopefully, brilliant right at the end of the tunnel but thank you exactly we look forward to seeing you and i just want to thank all of our all of our uh, audience members as well uh, I got through as many questions as I possibly could. Uh, they were really, really, really top class. And uh, yeah. I hope you enjoyed the rest of the conference. Uh, take care. Bye now. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye.